Hello everyone and welcome to my Out of Nowhere, where I've got a terrific guest on my show today. Her name is Kathleen Marsden. She has been an independent researcher of Photoshop Phenomena for more than 30 years. She is associate of Mutual UFO Network as a director of the Experience Research Team, what's set up of 30 specialists who offer support, non judgmental listening and referrals and experiences the Warridge Mitchell Foundation for Research in Extraterrestrials and Extraordinary Encounters. Call it free. Can we please welcome Kathleen to the show? Hello there. Hello. Nice to see you again. Thank you for coming on the show. My pleasure. Tell us a, a little about a bit, a bit about MUFON. We'll start with MUFON first. How did you get into MUFON? Well, back in 1991, I was looking for a UFO organization uh, to belong to. Of course, Betty Hill was my aunt. And I had done a great deal of work and study under her prior to that. I was 13 when they had their experience. But in 1991, I wanted to get involved and become a UFO investigator. So I knew people from the Mutual UFO Network in the state of New Hampshire, where I lived at that time. I'm now in Florida. And uh, so I was able to get the information to join the Mutual UFO Network, which is the largest civilian organization for the investigation of UFOs in the world. And uh, it was a good decision. I trained and became a field investigator and went on to become a state section director in New Hampshire. And from there, I went to the national level I was the director of, of uh, let's see, field investigator training for 10 years. And uh, then I wrote my first book, which was Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience, and started working on other books. And I was just so busy that I didn't have time to do that work any longer. But then in 2011, Clifford Clift, who was MUFON's director at that time in, in uh, worldwide, ended up uh, asking me to help MUFON out. They wanted to establish a team specifically uh, geared toward people who had been abducted or who had experiences. And so I ended up writing for uh, the field investigators manual, the protocols on how to investigate uh, a UFO abduction or contact experience. I started out with a team of three people and today it's actually 65 people. We have consultants. I'm now a consultant. Oh. I was the director for 10 years and uh, we so far have investigated uh, and talked to at least, I believe it was uh, 12,000 uh, people who believe that they had had contact with extraterrestrials. Oh, okay. So it has grown into quite a team. It is uh, really more of a supportive type of team than just uh, you know, just raw investigation where you're interrogating somebody and they're trying to prove that their statements are true. Uh, we just try to help people because we know that this is an experience that brings trauma and uh, anxiety to the people who are having this happen in their lives. So we wanted to reach out to these individuals sort of as a triage team to uh, uh, appoint one member of our team to contact them for a conversation. 
and to gather their information and their evidence and to hopefully, if they have evidence, to stay in contact with them because we know that people can have more than one experience. They can have many experiences. And where I have been able to get mm. evidence in my very best cases, it's always been with long-term contact because these people learn how to collect evidence and how to uh, keep a journal. And so everything works out well all around. We also have a list of support yeah. groups and a list of hypnotherapists uh, that people can enter into a private uh, relationship with. They're not part of MUFON, but it's sort of a referral. And of course we have chapters around the world. Great idea, Rita. Hi, you certainly do. You certainly do, Kathleen. Uh, can you please can you please give me an overview of the Betty and Barney Hills experience on the night of September nineteenth? Yes, September 19, 1961 was a, a big day for Betty and Barney. Because Betty was a social worker for the state of New Hampshire, and Barney worked for the post office. And uh, I had actually been to Niagara Falls a couple of months earlier and had shown Betty and Barney my photographs and talked about how much I enjoyed the trip. And so Barney said to Betty, uh, do you think you'd like to go to Niagara Falls? And she said that she would. So she had a week-long vacation from her job as a social worker for the state of New Hampshire. And he decided to surprise her with a trip to Niagara Falls. So they went off. Uh, they had a, a wonderful trip. And since it was a surprise, they didn't even have time to go to the bank. They just scraped together the cash they had at home. It was the days before... Uh, yeah. credit cards. So they did have gasoline car mm. cards <laughs> in those days. But they, wow. uh, so they went to Niagara Falls. They spent the night there. Um, they had a wonderful time. Then they went on to a location 112 miles west of Montreal and drove over to Montreal the following day and, uh, and were tourists in Montreal. And then they decided to uh, head back toward New Hampshire uh, because there was a hurricane coming up the coast. So they went driving toward New Hampshire and uh, stopped along the way to eat and enjoy themselves and finally arrived in upstate New Hampshire at 10 o'clock at night. And uh, they actually, a little before 10 o'clock at night, it was more like nine, I would say, uh, because they left the restaurant where they stopped at at 10 o'clock mm. and started heading south. Uh, so far, it was just a normal, enjoyable vacation trip. But as they drove south, uh, Betty spotted a new light in the sky that continued to grow larger and larger. And they pulled over a couple of times to, to look at this as it was coming in closer. When it was next to the old man of the mountain in Franconia Notch, they could see what looked like a cigar-shaped object that was rotating. They could see a row of windows on one side of it. And the old man of the mountain is uh, 42 feet from forehead to chin on the old man's profile. And they noticed that this craft was at least one and a half times the length of the profile. So a very large craft. Um, they looked at it and it started to move. It started to bounce back and forth in the sky. Barney compared it to a yo-yo, moving out and coming back, moving out and coming back. And they then got into the car. Barney wanted to go home. <laughs> he didn't believe it could possibly be 
a UFO or a flying saucer, as it was called mm. in those days. So uh, they got into the car. They're driving south. They enter uh, the uh, Lincoln, New Hampshire area where there are hotels for tourists, cabins in those days. Uh, but they weren't tired. So they decided to continue driving and continue to look for this craft when suddenly it surged ahead and stopped beside the highway. Barney stopped the car and got out of the car with his binoculars and looked up at this craft. What he could see was what he described as looking like a giant pancake just hanging in the sky. He realized that it was now disc shaped. It was oval. And instead of uh, being a cigar shaped craft, because he could now get a really good view of its shape. It was silent. He could see a row of windows and there was an intense blue white light shining through the windows. He stepped away from the car and the craft moved across the highway and stopped over an adjacent field. So Barney walked down the highway and to the edge of the field. He had his binoculars looking up, trying to identify uh, what this was, but he certainly could not identify it. He put his binoculars to his eyes and he noticed figures looking back at him. His initial report to NICAP was that they were figures humanoid dressed in black shiny uniforms. Humanoid meaning that they had a head, two arms, two legs, and a body, a torso. And all of them, except for one, turned toward what appeared to be a panel. Their arms went up and little red lights on fin-like structures started to slide out of the sides of the craft. And then uh, something started to slide out from the bottom of the craft. And Barney became terrified about this because this uh, figure was staring down at him and he was afraid that he was going to be captured, like he said, a bug in a net. And so uh, he went screaming back to the car to Betty, running uh, and uh, threw the binoculars on the seat, hopped into the car uh, and went speeding down the highway. But just before he entered the car, he saw the craft moving in his direction. Within moments, he and Betty heard a series of code-like buzzing sounds striking the trunk of their car. The next day, they found new shiny spots on the trunk, precisely where they had heard those buzzing sounds. And it caused a compass needle to rotate, uh, spinning and spinning, uh, indicating there was a magnetic field there that had not been there the previous day, along with those spots. But what happened when they heard those buzzing sounds was they could feel them in their bodies and in the car. They felt a tingling sensation in their bodies. And Betty felt the car to see if there was an electrical charge running through the vehicle. She wasn't electrocuted, fortunately. And, uh, but they sort of lost uh, conscious awareness at that point. And then at some time later, they found themselves 35 miles down the highway with a second series of buzzing sounds. They didn't see the craft this time, but it returned them to full consciousness and they were again talking. They did have some memories, some conscious memories that they wrote about. Uh, this is before they ever had hypnosis. They remembered the erratic pattern of the craft. They re remembered the close, close encounter. Barney remembered observing these figures that he said were somehow not human. 
they found themselves on a dirt road with tall trees all around. They remembered a fiery orb that seemed to be sitting on the ground. They remembered a roadblock. And then they were once again in, in that sort of third location uh, where they returned to full consciousness. They drove home. When they arrived home, it was 5.16 a.m. But at least that's what Betty's watch says. Uh, she noticed that her watch that she had wound at 10 o'clock was no longer working. So she set it for the time when she arrived home. The watch never worked again, nor did Barney's. Uh, oh. Betty's dress was torn. The dress she was wearing that night was torn in several places. She put it in her closet, and the next time she took it out, there was a pink powdery substance on that dress. The dress has been analyzed in numerous laboratories with anomalous findings. The latest finding is that it contains uh, on it rare and expensive metals that are abundant in our universe, but rare on planet Earth. Where did those come from? It doesn't make sense. Mm. Uh, there were uh, some. There's also some new DNA evidence in the location of Betty's navel, where we found uh, what appeared to be blood in that location. Uh, I sent the sample that we collected to Mufon's scientist. And she did a DNA analysis on it and determined that this was fluid from Betty's body in the area of the, her navel. So it could uh, indicate that her story about having a needle inserted into her navel mm. was true. So we have some good evidence. And as time passes, I've never stopped uh, looking for a scientific analysis of the evidence, and we have more. So, yeah. Um, when did you first hear about the, Kathleen? When did you first hear about the experience? Then, I heard about this experience on the day they arrived home. So it was actually the day that it happened, September twentieth, the day of the abduction because it was in the early morning hours. And when they arrived home in the early in the afternoon, Betty called my mother. And later that afternoon, she was on the phone with my mother again. And I arrived home from school. So I overheard my mother's conversation with Betty. And then my mother hung up the phone and uh, told me what had happened to Betty and Barney when they were turning home, and how concerned they were that they might have been contaminated because this craft was so close to them. So my mother agreed to call our neighbor, who was a physicist. And uh, they had taken very long showers, which was good. Uh, they had left their food and their mm -hmm. clothing outside in their suitcases. And uh, so they, you know, they, they laundered all of those things. And they took care of them. And the, the physicist said, told, is the one who told Buddy if she had a compass, take it out to her car to see how the compass would react to the car. So he knew something about the magnetic fields that are emitted mm -hmm. by these craft. And Betty, in fact, did find... Uh, a magnetic field around the trunk of the car where those new spots were that had not been there the day before. So Steph just, more good um, said the message. Yeah, Steph just said, people forget that those days interracial marriage wasn't the normal. Betty and Barney Hill had so many reasons to keep quiet that's one of the reasons why I believe them. Yes, they did. They Steph. never intended for this story to go public. 
but there was a violation of confidentiality in 1965. And it carried the story to a reporter from the Boston Traveler. His name was John Luttrell. He contacted Betty and Barney and wanted to speak with him. In fact, I have the letter. I'm the executor of the estate and the trustee. I set up an archival collection for them at the University of New Hampshire in the Milne Special Collections Library. But I have a more extensive collection at my home that Betty gave to me, including the hypnosis tapes. So uh, I've, I have all of that information and uh, I'm keeping this story alive and continuing to do the research and investigation on this case. And Betty no, and Barney, think about it, was Betty there any physical to go public? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. John Luttrell. No, that's all right. I, I like Yeah, uh, John Luttrell, the newspaper reporter, they didn't want to go. Um, went against Betty's and Barney's uh, will and wrote five articles in the Boston Traveler. So this is how it got out to the public initially. And I'm sorry, go ahead. What were you saying? Yeah. Was there any physical, any physical evidence? And if so, what? The physical evidence was Betty's dress, as I have spoken, uh, the watches that stopped, uh, the, uh, there were deep scrapes on the tops of Barney's best dress shoes. And I was able to discover uh, from Barney's statements to Dr. Simon, who was the neuropsychiatrist who treated him for post-traumatic stress disorder, that uh, Barney, who was a meticulous dresser, uh, discovered that his shoes were scraped when he arrived home. They had been fine before this event. But under hypnosis, he remembered how when he was being escorted, he felt as if he was uh, floating. He was being taken to this craft and only the toes of his shoes were bumping along the rocks. And then he felt them slide up and incline. So that's how his uh, shoes were destroyed. Betty's dress was torn in several places. Uh, one, the hem was torn down and the lining was torn from waist to hemline when she tried to fight for her life and kicked one of these ETs who was taking her to craft. And then her zipper was broken when the examiner tried to remove her dress but didn't know how to operate a zipper. So he just tore it apart. And uh, so that's another piece of evidence in addition to the scientific tests on the dress. Um, because the binocular strap was broken, but that happened when Barney was in the field and he became so frightened that he just tore the binoculars away from his eyes. But it's another piece of physical evidence. Um, so we have uh, many pieces of evidence under hypnosis. Uh, um, well, not really hypnosis, but when I was uh, interviewing Betty in, two, in the year 2000, I believe it was, yeah. I asked her about the symbols that she saw inside a book uh, on this craft. It wasn't really a book. It was more like a tablet. Uh, there was a screen with uh, yeah. rows of vertical rows of symbols. She sketched some of those from memory, and I published them in my book with Stanton Friedman, Captured the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience. Now, Dr. Don C. Don Derry from McGill University had worked on two studies on abductees' symbols. He had gotten the symbols from Bud Hopkins, who had them in a locked file uh, who had gotten them from the hip, the abductees that he had hypnotized. And Dr. Don Derry and Dr. Stuart Appel 
took those and did a scientific study on those symbols. And they discovered that the symbols from the abductees were so similar and so different from their control group that it could indicate that alien abduction is real. Well, Dr. Don Derry saw those symbols in the book that I had published years later, and he compared them to the symbols yeah. that he had used in his study. And he wrote and he said that Betty's, the symbols that Betty drew were nearly identical to the symbols that Bud Hopkins had been collecting dating back uh, to the mid 1970s. So more evidence. There was a, the star map as well that Betty recalled under hypnosis. And mm. Dr. Simon asked her to sketch. She went home and over the next two weeks, she sketched it. He had given her the suggestion she would sketch it only if she could remember it accurately and if it didn't bother her too badly. So she did. And then Marjorie Fish, who was a brilliant woman from Ohio and an amateur astronomer, took an interest in that star map. She thought that if those stars were anywhere in our galactic neighborhood, she would be able to find them. And she worked for years on this. It was before we had computers. So uh, she had to build three-dimensional models. She had to go to the university and copy all of the distance data and all of the characteristics of all of the stars in our galactic neighborhood out 54 light years. And then she had to build models that had our sun and our solar system and all of the other stars out 54 light years in every direction from our sun. It took her years. She still couldn't find a match. But then we made technological progress. We were able to measure the distance data from the stars more accurately. She built another model. She rearranged the, um, the stars in this portion of space and she had a match. Next, scientists vetted that. Um, Alan Hynek vetted Marjorie's work for accuracy, and it was accurate. Um, David Saunders, a statistician, did a statistical analysis on it and said that it was accurate. Also, uh, other astronomers who looked at it, one said, that if we lived on Zeta Reticuli, which was the originating star system, that and we were exploring oh, yeah. our local galactic neighborhood, that we would follow the same route to our uh, solar system that was on Betty's map. So many scientists began to believe that this was real that it was a real experience. Uh, you know, all of the stars on Betty's map were sun-like stars, although only 5% of the stars in our local galactic neighborhood out 54 light years are sun-like. And all of the sun-like stars on that volume of space were in on Betty's map. So it was pretty remarkable. There's been an update. There was an update done in 2003 using a computerized model uh, with more than uh, 2,500 possible models of our galactic neighborhood. And the person oh. who did that discovered that Marjorie Fish's identification was the closest of any. So quite good oh, evidence. Rebecca's got a yeah, Rebecca's got a question. In uh, true, Betty managed to experience after the fact better than Barney. Yes, it is absolutely is true? true. Now remember that Betty was sitting in this on the seat of the car in the passenger seat 
when Barney got out of the car to look at the craft and then walked down the street into the field to look up at the craft. And that's where he saw these non-humans and feared for his life, that he was going to be captured. Betty was inside the car. The door had been left open. The engine was running. It was lighted. She couldn't even see outside. She initially saw it over the road, but not when Barney was looking at it. So Barney uh, had all of this conscious recall that Betty did not have because she didn't see it. Betty had more memory of the dirt road, finding themselves on the dirt road. But uh, now Betty, I think, was, was very different than Barney. She already believed that UFOs were real. Barney did not. He dismissed the idea. Uh, she uh, came from the kind of society where uh, my family dates back to the 1600s in New England. We were some of the original settlers. We were never slaves. We were never indentured servants. Uh, we were never under anyone's control. We were always secure. Barney, being Black, grew up in a segregated society where his life could always be uh, at risk, where he was mistreated because of the color of his skin, because he wasn't given the opportunities that he deserved because of the color of his skin. His IQ was 140. He was a very bright man. Oh Betty God. also had a high IQ. Um, so, you know, they uh, were an intelligent couple, uh, but emotionally, Barney had uh, sort of this emotional baggage already of being uh, uncomfortable as a black man in American society. So uh, that we believe that that might have contributed as well as Barney's conscious recall and feeling so threatened. Well, um, I know that I've just missed a question. I think it was about what happened to the dog? The dog. <laughs> the uh, Their dogs yeah. were with them, little Delcy. And uh, she reacted to the craft. It, it, apparently, the buzzing sounds hurt her ears. So she reacted in that way. Uh, also, she apparently remained in the car when Betty and Barney were taken to craft but I suspect that the ET's hands might have touched the dog. The reason I suspect that is because Barney's, uh, Betty's dress, excuse me, uh, ended up having either a fungus or a yeast grow on it. It turned the blue dress pinkish in the areas where the ET's oh, touched it. And so we, the scientists believe that this was uh, either fungus or yeast from the ET's hands and from the, e the floor of the craft where Betty's dress was dropped. If the ET's touched Delcy, then that fungus could have been transferred to her back and caused the infection that she developed when they arrived home. Or perhaps Betty and Barney had it on their hands. Betty was touching things on the craft. Barney uh, had his hands down when he was lying on the table. So, you know, there's a good chance that it came from their hands as well as possibly ET hands. But when they arrived home, Delcy seemed frightened and she started to have nightmares and her little legs would run um, after that. So, you know, she was traumatized as well. Right. Uh, a question for uh, Kathleen again. Uh, Alessia, question for Kathleen. Is it often that 
other family members over generations get taken by UFOs? Thank you. Do you think they take people randomly, randomly or do they know who they take? Well, to answer your first question, uh, family members over generations do get taken by UFOs. I've, I've worked on three pretty comprehensive studies. And uh, I'm looking at my results right now. Generational contact is prevalent in 50% of experiencers overall. But then we had a second uh, uh, group in our study at the Mutual UFO Network. This was a, a three-year study of 516 experiencers. And 60% of those had family members who had been abducted. And 60% of those family members had also had a close encounter with a craft and observed non-humans on the craft. So yes, it is intergenerational. We know in at least 60% of the people who participated. Um, and do people get taken randomly or uh, they know who to take? So what the ETs have told people is that initially they took people randomly uh, from the back lands of the family farm or people who were driving or camping. When they found what they were looking for, then they began to take people along intergenerational lines. And I believe that is why now 75% of the people that we have worked with in these surveys uh, say that they were taken for the first time when they were less than 20 years old. 36% when they were less than five years old. Ooh, very interesting. Have you seen a UFO yourself then? Yes, I have. I used to go out with my Aunt Betty when I was a child. We'd go out as a family. And I did have a fairly close encounter uh, with a craft. We also had one that landed and left physical trace evidence on the ground across the street from my childhood home on my grandparents' farm. And so over the years, I have seen craft. Yes. Uh, you have been involved in three major studies of our experiences. Tell us about your studies. Okay. The first study I did with Denise Stoner, it, had, it was a smaller one. It had only 75 people. 50 of them were experiencers or abductees. The other 25 were members of the general population. We wanted to be able to identify um, commonalities that experiencers share that are not common in the general population. And we were able to identify uh, 23. Then we moved on to um, the uh, to free the uh, Edgar Mitchell Foundation for research into extraterrestrial and extraordinary encounters. And this was a, a very large study, 3,500 people. Uh, when we finally did the statistical analysis, we had PhD academics doing this statistical analysis on this and uh, very, very interesting results. And then I mentioned the three-year study that my team and I did with uh, through the mutual UFO network of 516 abductees. Now, Free's study and, uh, and MUFON's study uh, yielded pretty similar results, only Free had more people participating who were having pleasurable experiences with uh, these non humans, and MUFON had more people who uh, were kind of traumatized. But what we discovered is that uh, uh, 
53% had health problems related to contact. 49% had migraines, 45% nosebleeds, 44% had chronic fatigue and immune dysfunction syndrome. Uh, but some people were healed. Among the abductee group who had asked for healing, 45% were healed. 61% had paranormal experiences in their home. Now, the most common paranormal experiences were observing light orbs in their home or having the sensation that something unseen was walking on the mattress. 75% among the abductee group. Also, the vast majority became more spiritually oriented. Um, they became psychic. They became empaths, where, in, in fact, the, among the abductee group, 95% said they were empaths now, meaning that they could feel or sense the uh, condition of somebody else's body. If there was pain in the body, they could feel the pain as in their own bodies. They could sense another person's emotions, that sort of thing. Um, okay, uh, they were taken uh, four times, 54%, more than 50 times, 10%. Uh, most said that uh, they, they observed a UFO at less than 500 feet away from them, 70% among the abductees. Uh, they had experienced the symptoms of sleep paralysis. But when we asked, laid in another question, if they had been awake, but then observed uh, light and entities entering their room and then became paralyzed, uh, 60% of the abductee group said yes, they had been awake when they were taken. So that meant that it wasn't sleep paralysis as all of the uh, skeptics like to say that all of this is the result of sleep paralysis. It is not, according to our studies and also academic studies. Um, uh, 58% of the experiencer group and 65% of the abductees said that they had missing time and they were aware of this missing time. And it was generally averaged out to about two hours, but we had people who were taken for as many as five days uh, who participated in our study. They said that these ETs were mostly business-like, 65% of the abductee group. Um, only 6% said they were hostile, 10% said they were evil, there were more grays than, uh, seen than the rest of the other groups, but humanoid types or human types were second, insectoid or mantis types were third, reptilians were fourth, hybrids 22%, and then my lab abductions where the military is involved, only 13%. So uh, some very interesting statistics. We asked, would you like this to stop if you could make it stop? And very surprisingly, 71% said, no, we wanted to continue. So even the, through the trauma, uh, they wanted it to continue because they were now being healed. They were growing older. They were now receiving information from these non-humans. So we had some really interesting findings on these three studies. Oh, God, yeah. Um, there's another question from Rebecca. Question, do people generally have positive or negative experiences? About the same percentage of people have positive or negative experiences. It's about 20% on each end, which leads about 60% in the middle who say, well, it was more business-like. They might have been traumatized initially, but then they got used to it. So it was sort of neutral in a sense. 
But everybody in oh, the beginning, really? generally, everybody is traumatized until they get help, until they can understand what is happening to them. So if it's trauma, you might view it as negative. But in, in the long run, about 20% view it as negative. Yeah. Um, what are the most pre prevalent commodities among experiences of non-human contact? Repeat that again. I missed some of it. What are the most prevalent commodities oh, among experiences of non yeah of yeah, human well, contact? The most prevalent commonalities were um, having been awake during at least one contact, having had a close encounter with a craft, uh, having these new changes to become more psychic, to become more spiritual, um, to perceive the world differently than they had previously, to care more about the world and the people in the world, to be more peace-seeking. Um, when they're on the craft, oftentimes they're uh, shown images of uh, nuclear warfare on our planet and, and nuclear destruction. They're there's uh, education about the environment and how they need to be in environmentally cautious. And so um, these changes take place in experiencers of contact. And I've talked to many who are, have actually gone into the environmental field uh, because of their, their contact experiences. What common messages have experiences been given by non-human? Um, many different types. In my latest book, Forbidden Knowledge, um, it's both in, in one and two, books one and two. Uh, I talk about an experiment that I took part in for a period of two years where we met once a month with a confirmed experiencer who... Uh, was communicating with these non-human entities. They did give us uh, proof uh, in the form of uh, experiencing them, feeling their strong tingling, communicating with them telepathically, and even seeing orbs and craft in the sky uh, together with and separately with them uh, too. So uh, we asked 116 questions that are in my books, but just briefly, uh, some of the things that they've uh, told experiencers is that they are not here to harm us, that they have been here since the beginning of time, of life on this planet. They come back from time to time in order to monitor our development and that periodically they give us upgrades. They became very concerned when we were developing nuclear weapons because it tears into the fabric of time and space and goes out into the other dimensions and harms the people who live in the other dimensions. And many of these uh, ETs say that they are from the fifth and sixth dimensions. That doesn't mean that they're interdimensional just here on this planet. It means that they could have come uh, from out in space on a planet that's in the fifth or sixth dimension. So that is possible as well. Uh, they uh, want to upgrade us so that we will not destroy this planet. Their greatest concern is nuclear warfare. And, you know, you have many reports of them being present during our wars, uh, just, just sitting there. But sometimes they've also uh, taken uh, various sides and uh, destroyed things. 
uh, in order to give one side a, a greater advantage from what I've read. So uh, they uh, do take people along family lines. And the reason for this, they said, is because we, uh, they are able, not we, but they are able to uh, study the progress that they've made in the genetics improvements that they have made to humans intergenerationally. So they're working on these genetic studies to upgrade the human race. And the reason they're doing this, they said, is because our technological progress is out of sync with our spiritual growth and development. And when this happens, they've seen it happen on other planets, it could lead to genocide, it could lead to uh, the extinction of everything on the planet as the result of nuclear warfare. And that's their major concern. Right. Another question from Rebecca. Do religious people struggle more to accept them than atheists? You know, that's hard to say. Um, I've, I've worked with, the, with religious people and with atheists. The problems that the religious people have is the lack of somebody that they can talk to uh, and who they can trust. Because when they speak with other religious people, particularly when it's with fundamentalist Christians or born-again Christians, uh, these Christians are viewing them as having contact with demons. And that's not really what is happening. But this is the treatment that they receive from the religious community, which isn't really fair whatsoever. So they struggle more with the religious community than uh, atheists would. But uh, the ETs have uh, given us information that there is one creator and that all of us come under sort of the, the umbrella of this one creator. So they believe in, you might say, God, uh, just as we do. They don't worship the same way that we do they say, but that belief is there. Hmm, very interesting. Question from uh, Alicia. Uh, do you think there's connection between what we believe are angels and aliens or multidimensional beings? Uh, okay, so there is some kind of connection, and I'm uh, from what I have been able to gather, um, many ETs are actually multi-dimensional. I have video from one of uh, my best evidence cases, and I've I have uh, investigated many, many thousands of cases over the years uh, privately. And in one of my best cases, it was also uh, investigated by the Mutual UFO Network. It happened in North Carolina, a, uh, an experiencer whose experience had been uh, proven to be real, uh, along with uh, two women who were paranormal investigators who went to his property to conduct a study. And they ended up, all three of them, being abducted. But the two women who were top-notch scientific paranormal investigators had left a Bell and Howell video camera running. And this camera ran for a, a little bit of time when these non-humans were coming in. And the way they came in was on a beam of light, 
uh, they dropped off that beam of light and uh, floated toward the ground. So it appears that they were orbs or they were not three-dimensional when they were carried in this beam of light, but they became three-dimensional after they exited the light. First, they were translucent and then they became solid. That's what I have observed. So I think that these ETs who ride in craft, uh, maybe some of them are three-dimensional, but some of them are fifth and sixth dimensional as well. Um, in terms of angels, angels are often interpreted on, uh, as being extraterrestrial on the uh, 20% and of positive experiences. They come as light beings or as uh, beings that look very human. And uh, sometimes they are angels. People see them as angels and they're very caring. They heal people. Um, they're, it's just a wonderful experience for people who have this happen on this end. They keep people uh, there was one man who was quadriplegic as the result of a diving accident. And this angel would come to him and give him the strength to move on, to go on. Uh, we have cases in the United States, I'm aware of at least three, where uh, sort of biblical feature, uh, biblical symbols have uh, come into the abductee's environment. So first it was an abduction, but then in one case, uh, Chris Bledsoe's case, it's like the, the divine feminine who's coming in and giving him prophecy. And he has a confirmed case. Another case was in the Northwest. And the man in this case uh, was being visited by the archangel Michael. And then there was another case where uh, there was a sort of divine intervention uh, coming in with these more positive extraterrestrials. So there seems to be some kind of overlap, but I, I can't say right now the degrees. I don't have the statistics. I'm working on a study of that kind of thing right now. So if you can go to my website at Kathleen-Martin.com, uh, please take part in the survey that you'll find on uh, my menu. It's the Marden Stoner survey. Uh, it's on religious belief. Anyone can take part in it, actually. You don't have to have ever seen a UFO. You don't have to even believe that they're real. Uh, but if you have, there are 50 questions. If you have not, there are only 25 questions. <laughs> I like that. I know um, Steph was just saying, on that particular night with Betty and Barney, something else was seen in the sky at the same time. Something caught on radar that night as well. Yes, and in fact, if the, you knew that. Two, radars, two radar arrays caught something else on the radar that night. One was in North Concord, Vermont, and uh, it was earlier in the evening that it caught a very large object moving erratically against the wind. It was only 17 miles from where Betty and Barney had their experience. And then later that night, after Betty and Barney were released, there was uh, a craft seen in the sky in uh, it was on radar in Newington, New Hampshire at Pease Air Force Base. There were also 12 to 14 witnesses who observed the craft that night. They reported this to John Luttrell, who was the first newspaper reporter who broke the story uh, through that violation of confidentiality where he found out about it. But he did a very thorough analysis and wrote terrific articles in the Boston Traveler. I still have those articles. 
And when that was published, he had found six witnesses to the craft that night. I have a letter that he wrote later on where he had found more witnesses and he was able to determine where each of those witnesses was standing and where Betty and Barney were. And then he drew lines between their locations and where Betty and Barney were with the craft and all of those lines intersected. So very good evidence there that there were witnesses to this craft that night. Thank you for that. Um, can you tell everybody where you can find your books? Well, um, all of my books. I know you. Uh, in the U.S., you can buy uh, all of autographed copies of my books from my website. But if you live outside the U.S., then you can go to Amazon. And all of the books are available on Amazon in multiple formats. You can buy them as audiobooks, ebooks. Uh, so just look under my name. Uh, I think that you'll find I have seven books. I think that you'll find them. Uh, if you don't see it under my name, look under Stanton Friedman's name. I think that Fact, Fiction, and Flying Saucers is a, a book that we co-authored, and that might be not be listed under my name, but I'm pretty sure that the others are. But you can find all of them on my website, so you can look in my book, uh, bookstore on my website to see what books are available. So if anybody and then go to Amazon. So if anybody anybody wants to get in touch with you about a sighting or anything, where can they find you? Okay, people can reach me at uh, my website and that's kathleen-marden.com. Uh, there's a place where they can uh, write to me. And uh, I will write a short reply to you. If you want to report a sighting or a UFO abduction, you can go to MUFON. Uh, I know that MUFON's website is down right now, uh, but you can contact the ERT if you've had a UFO abduction or contact experience and get in touch with someone at the ERT. Experience or resource team. Thank you so much for that. It's been wonderful. Thank you to everyone in the chat room tonight for their great questions. It's always great when uh, you've got people in the chat room as well who want to ask the guest questions. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you again, Kathleen. It's been yes, wonderful. Yes, thank you and My thank you for everyone who wrote. Yes, fantastic. Uh, my guest on Wednesday, the 17th, it is Paul, Paul Askoff. Um, so a while ago since he's been on the show, uh, he's a great guest. Um, so that's Wednesday, the 17th, at 2 o'clock Eastern, 11 o'clock Pacific, at 7 p 7 p.m. in the UK. Well, thank you again. Me, everybody saying thank you. Great guest again tonight. They're all saying that in the chat room. So thank you, Kathleen. Okay. You take Bye. care. And I will catch up with you again. Okay. Sounds great. I'll just send the show. Okay. Here it is.